Good morning, everyone. My name is Maura Saltzman. I'm from the University of Michigan, and I'm going to talk today on the Jeju Otakin Dictionary, along with Catherine Jiang and Rishma Balakrishnan, who will come in towards the end of this presentation. To give a bit of background, Jeju is an endangered language spoken on Jeju Island, which is about 100 miles southwest of South Korea, and is also spoken on, in Osaka, Japan. At this point, there are 5,000 to 10,000 native speakers of Jeju, and fluent speakers are generally over the age of 75. There are no longer any monolingual speakers, so Jeju speakers are also fluent in Korean, and those who are living in Osaka are usually trilingual in Korean, Jeju, and Japanese, although some people are fluent only in Jeju and Japanese. The islands of Jeju province have a population of around 600,000, but it is a huge tourist destination. So 15 million tourists were there in 2019, and that number is expected to grow exponentially when the second airport comes in in the next couple of years. Jeju is also spoken in the Tsuruhachi neighborhood of Osaka, um, which is a small diasporic enclave of Jeju citizens but unfortunately in that area, it hasn't been transmitted to the second generation of people born in Osaka. So these images are from the Korean market in Tsuruhashi and compared with uh, the data we have on Jeju spoken in Jeju Island, we have a lot less data here. We don't know the exact numbers of speakers and we don't have a lot of sociolinguistic information about language use and domains of use. Whether Jeju is a language in its own right or a dialect of Korean is debated in Korea, although uh, the two languages are mutually unintelligible and have only 8 to 12 percent mutual intelligibility with only 20 to 25 percent of the lexicon shared, as well as semantic differences with those cognates. In Korea, uh, from linguists on the mainland, most people would call Jeju an unintelligible dialect of Korean. Jeju is genetically related to Korean, but there's also debate over where Jeju lies in the family tree. And one of the issues with this is that naming Jeju a separate language defies the unification of Korea, which metalinguistically focuses on one country, one language, which came into play after the um, independence from Japan in 1945. Jeju does have a very distinct culture from mainland Korea, and it's known as Samdado, which is uh, the island of three abundances, and those abundances are rocks, wind, and women. So until modern times and everything that has changed with the tourism industry, um, the island was fairly matriarchal. So women were the economic heads of the family, and the shamanic myths revolved around grandmother goddesses. Jeju also had an agricultural and fishing economy where Hamia, the female divers, were in the prominent economic role. And as a whole, the island had a strong respect for the environment. There's also an, an active shamanic tradition in Jeju, which is quite separate from shamanic traditions on the mainland and a robust regional mythology. And the oral history of Jeju, as Jeju was an unwritten language, was transmitted between generations through the shamanic traditions. The cuisine is also unique to Jeju Island, as well as the architecture. So here on the top left, we can see the Hania. Um, this is probably from a couple of years ago. So the Hania these days are between 60 and 90 years old and are still active as free divers. On the far right is a Jeju shaman, and I think there are about 17 active shaman shamans now. Most of them are female. And in the middle is the architecture that's indigenous to Jeju Island. This is, this is a home called a Chogaji, which is a thatch roof house, and the walls are made of lava rock and mud. And the fence system in front, the front gate, is called a Jongnang. And this has a special meaning to it, depending on where you place these wooden bars. So if all three are up, then the person is not home, not coming back soon. And if two are up, it's some other matter of time. 
If all of them are gone, the person is home. And in the back, we can see the weather patterns of Jeju and like the climate, which is very rocky, windy, rainy, generally. For a sketch of the language, Jeju is SOV and agglutinative like Korean, but it also preserves many features of middle Korean in all levels of the language, including the lexicon, the phonology and the syntax and famously has a phoneme that was lost on the mainland from Middle Korean called the Area. There is also a large inventory of loan words in Jeju from Japanese, Mongolian, and Manchu. And unlike Korean, which has six, there are four discourse registers, which are marked by verbal endings. And Jeju has a smaller inventory of honorific lexical items than does Korean, and a unique inventory of idiophones. Also some cognates, but there's at least 200 unique idiophones. So I'm not sure that this will be able to be heard over Zoom, so I'll just read it. This is a Jeju sample. And the first recording was from was in Korean, the second was in Jeju, and both mean the grandmother and grandchild are picking oranges in the field. So the first one is harmony wa sonia ga batteso milgamun dago itta. And the second one is sonji harmony mikan tamsara. So you can see that there are some cognates here, but the phonology is different and the morphology is different as well. At this point, Jeju has been classified as a critically endangered language. And this was classified by UNESCO in 2010. And some of the reasons for the language shift to Korean were the Sasam Sakan, which is a massacre that happened in 1948 when approximately 30% of Jeju speakers were killed and another 25,000 people fled to Osaka. The Korean War in 1950 also changed the decline of the language permanently. So the island of Jeju's population doubled during the Korean War, and about 100,000 migrants came from the mainland, all speaking different dialects of standard Korean. Um, the New Village Movement was a movement meant to reform Korea culturally. It started in 1971 under the Park Chun Hee administration, and this banned indigenous practices like shamanic rituals which had been the way of transmitting oral history and which had contained a lot of archaic Jeju as well. Also education was standardized under the new village movement and most classrooms forbade any use of Jeju. So Korean is usually used in governmental institutions, education, media, and communicating with outsiders and Jeju is generally used in the home, in the marketplace, in shamanic rituals, and in intimate settings between community members, which means from 1971 or around that time in the 20th century, a deglacia has started to form in Jeju Island. And some of the attitudes that are shared by speakers are that Jeju represents an absence of boundaries between speakers, which could cause offense to an interlocutor who judges this kind of intimate register inappropriate. Um, it's also perceived as showing a relaxed mood. And one speaker said, when we calm down, the dialect comes out naturally. Jeju is linked to emotionality, and it's the preferred variety for expressing feelings and emotional involvement. So some speakers think that emotional messages will be better understood if expressed in Jeju as well as mimetic words and idiophones, were, which are not translatable to Korean. One of the reasons for the low prestige value and that Korean is considered more respectful somehow is that Jeju has, although Jeju has distinct honorific registers as does Korean, these phrases are shorter and are seen as lacking in the morphological formality that Korean has. So something like hashisunika, which would mean like, uh, did they do it? Would be hesugwang, which is equally formal in Jeju, and yet uh, metalinguistically has a sense of being less formal based on the morphology. 
In a 2013 questionnaire, um, Chang Yong Yang found that Jeju was strongly linked to the identity of Jeju, and that Jeju speakers generally want to continue to use the language in the future. However, there is a disinterest in transmitting Jeju to children and younger generations because education is so important, and education in Korea is oriented towards standardized testing with standard Korean at the top as well as English. Korean language policy is decided by three different government bodies. And until very recently, maybe 2019, all the language surrounding the use of Korean in the classroom was that Korean should be used correctively, correctly and effectively for students to develop the right attitude toward the correct and effective use of the language. And through these language activities, students would be able to achieve enhanced cognition and imagination. So, Korean was at the top of the ladder for uh, the contact periods allocated in classrooms, and it was a prescriptivist Korean. So this is a sample of um, contact periods by subject for primary school, and we can see that Korean is at the top, which is about twice as many hours allocated to it than any other subject. And this continues throughout education, but by high school, English is near the top as well. So we see a contact-based shift where younger speakers are shifting to Korean and younger speakers also self-assess themselves as fluent Jejua speakers when they might not actually be speaking the fluent Jejua. So a younger speaker might um, give the sentence, which is more or less a Korean sentence and the blue here is what is borrowed from Jejua. Harmang is a cultural membership marker, um, means grandmother, and Isuda is a verbal endings. And this is one that um, would be very easy to understand to a Korean speaker. So this is basically a Korean sentence that borrows Jejua um, content words and verbal endings. However, in Osaka, um, I found that people said harmony hoko sonji hoko mikano tamsura. So this is a fluent Jejua sentence. These both mean the same thing. And they've borrowed harmony, meaning grandmother, maybe because um, it's more formal and more respectful. But this is almost a minimal pair in language usage. There are many current revitalization efforts for Jejua, but these tend to be more symbolic and more top-down. There hasn't been a lot of interest that comes from the bottom up or that joins top-down government initiatives. These also tend to be discrete projects. So there are several Jejua research centers now, but they tend not to work together and there's no greater campaign for Jejua language revitalization. There's inconsistent programming. So there might be a special um, community or media-based program, but it occurs at most two hours a week or something um, like a special program for children, like a language contest, but that might be one day a month. And in order to actually achieve fluency for younger generations, we would need immersion programs in Jejua. So our project, the Talking Dictionary of Jejua, is a free online multimedia repository of Jejua that's intended to be multimodal, meaning that we would have language learning modules, games, an audio dictionary, browsable photos, printable transcripts of videos, and 200 hours of video of natural speech. And ideally, there would be a linguistic training of community language activists to continue the documentation of Jeju where community elders are consultants so that this could be a sustainable project in the future that we wouldn't have to be directly involved with and that would be owned by the Jeju community. Our current team is a small group of local and international scholars of linguistics, anthropology, geography, and mythology, local educators on Jeju Island, activists, and community members from the Jeju Preservation Society, as well as undergraduate researchers from the University of Michigan that we'll hear from later. 
And some of the recording sites are Jeju Community Centers and individual homes, as well as spaces in Osaka, like the Saranbang, which is a place where elderly Koreans, many of whom are from Jeju, um, the Jeju Community Temple, which is another gathering space for Jeju immigrants and outdoor casual spaces in the Korean market, which you can see all of these here. We intend for the Jeju Talking Dictionary to be multimodal to serve diverse communities so that scientists and linguists and other academic researchers can browse linguistic features such as question making or discourse markers, turn taking, or browse or search individual morphemes or people part of the other communities such as the Jeju semi-speaker community or Jeju speaking community can browse broader topics like anatomy, cuisine, geography. People can also interact with the talking dictionary in different modes. So you can interact with the dictionary in a language learning mode and access lessons, or you can interact with the dictionary in different languages such as English, Korean, Jeju, and eventually in Japanese. So this is what um, some of the information for a video would look like. We would have the uh, ongoing transcript in Jeju, Korean, and English, some notes, and everything would be broken down into morphemes as well. And this would be a printable transcript. And I won't play it because I don't think it's gonna work too well on Zoom, but this is a weed cutting song and we've collected um, several songs across the island, which all differ a bit regionally and are really fun to compare. And from here, I'll let Catherine take it.
So in conclusion, at this point, Jejua must be transmitted to younger generations before the last generation of fluent speakers disappears. And in order to do this, immersion classes are necessary as well as status planning based on sociolinguistic research, corpus planning, um, including the standardization of orthography and the development of school curriculum and documentation and revitalization tools like the one we talked about today. So thank you very much for listening. Come up to that and we'll be happy to respond to any questions or comments.